Uh, hey, welcome everyone. Do you hear me? It's, I think Tobias, are you already, should you already be on stage? Not sure. <laughs> Hello everyone. Welcome to the Offers and a Deal webinar on the state of remote team cultures and how to engage staff teams across borders. My name is Eileen uh, and we're waiting for a few more people to join. So feel free to settle in, grab a coffee or a tea. And we'd love to learn more from where you guys are joining for. So uh, share your answers in the chat. Um, feel free to share your name, your LinkedIn profile so we can connect uh, to each other. I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, so don't be shy. Share something uh, about yourself, your name, where you're from. Well, getting started in a, uh, in a bit, so... Um... Let's uh, let's share something on the chat. Maybe I still don't see anyone uh, communicating, but it would be great to uh, get the conversation starting before I get everyone on stage with me to uh, to discuss more around the the webinar. So I think people are are entering. I think we are we are ready to start. Mm, let's get the presentation slides up. I think they're still loading. Let me wait for the support from uh, from Alex, who's gonna help me from uh, hosting this webinar. I think there might be something wrong because I do see that people are seeing something. I do not see the presentation uh, deck yet, but let me just uh, start with um, sharing a little bit more. So welcome everyone, um, everyone who just joined. My name is Eileen and I will be hosting this webinar today. I work at Deal and I'm the sales manager there. I recently joined, so since the 1st of March, very, uh, very new to the company. A little bit about Deal. So Deal is your global people platform where we are that one-stop shop for all HR and payroll needs. And before we dive into all of the interesting topics for today, just a little bit around the organizers of the webinar. So OfferZen is a developer hiring marketplace that helps 2,000 plus companies in South Africa to hire remote job seek software developers. Um, and let me share a little bit about details before we dive in. So first of all, remember, we cannot see you guys. So if you pull your hands or if you want to share something, please do it in the chat and we will be able to, uh, to answer all of your questions. And if you drop off on the video, you can come back anytime. Just use the same link that you received to get into this uh, webinar. Um, finally, you can use the, the chat tab like, uh, like I shared for any comments. Um, my co-hosts are keeping an eye on the, on the chat as well. So make sure to address them during the conversation or at the end where we also have some, uh, some questions where you can uh, ask our experts to, uh, to support. So let me get my um, co-hosters on stage. Let me introduce the panel to you. Um, Alex, can you invite them to stage? Hey, I see Nadia popping up. Hello. Toyo's there as well. 
Perfect, Michael here. So let me jump off to, to the event. Um, three years after the pandemic, an overnight shift to remote focus on work setup in tech culture has changed drastically. What are leaders doing to drive team culture or is team culture a thing of the past? So in this session with our lovely uh, attendees and also, of course, my co-host, we will um, discuss what is the status of a team culture in a remote world? What are tech le leaders doing to drive team cultures in their distributed teams? And at the time, what is the importance of a team culture or has that been shifted due to the fact uh, of uh, full remote teams? So let's kick off. Let me uh, get Nadia to introduce herself uh, to you guys. Great, thanks for having me, uh, Eileen and Toby, Michael, so happy to be in the same space as both of you. Uh, and welcome, I saw so many amazing countries like Berlin, um, Istanbul, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, Joburg, I just saw so many cities uh, loading in the chat, so it was nice to see that. I am Nadia Vatalidis, Interim Director of Talent Acquisition at Kamunda. Uh, Kamunda is a process orchestration company that literally connects technology, um, people, and tools. Uh, it's been an amazing journey so far, and I'm dialing in from sunny South Africa today. Great. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks, Nadia. Great to have you with us. Tobias, can you share a little bit more uh, about yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you all. I'm looking forward to this uh, event with you. And I, I love the comments that are coming up. Please keep them coming. Uh, it's so good to see. Uh, yeah, I'm Toby. I'm currently uh, living in Cyprus, uh, originally from Germany. I am uh, have a background in software engineering for almost 20 years now. And I am currently a tech advisor, interim tech and engineering lead and a product advisor for software startups and working remotely since a bit more than six years now. Perfect, thanks. And last but not least, Michael. Hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm Michael Tempest. I uh, live in the UK, um, somewhere in the middle. Nobody knows where it is, so it's fine. Um, I've been in uh, tech for about 10 years or so, going from software engineer to team lead, and then just kind of working in those areas. And then when the pandemic hit, that's where I started focusing a lot on remote work because I realized that you can't just take the office Put it into remote you have to really move things forwards which is why i put so much focus into asynchronous um, and experimenting with that type of stuff and i've learned a huge amount over the past few years and my focus now is trying to help people um, apply those things and those experimentations to their own teams to their own businesses to everyone around them just to try and get into a world where asynchronous working remote working becomes the new norm um, and flexibility is at the heart of what we do in our jobs. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing. I'm very interested to learn more uh, in the discussions with all the topics that we'll discuss today. So let's check the audience poll here. Um, Alex, if you can share the, the poll with the team. So who currently works in a remote environment? Please share your answers. Great. And the next one, who in the room has or is currently hiring for remote roles? Interesting. I see a lot of movement there. I see people are currently hiring, have hired. So a lot of experts in the room here, uh, I would say today. So that's great. Uh, great to see. So let's dive into uh, the first team of today. Um, what is the status of culture in remote world? World. So remote teams have always been a lot more common for deaf teams than any other professions. But since the pandemic, remote and cross-border teams have set up has become much more common everywhere. So over the past year, some companies have started pushing for return to the office. Um, two of the core reasons are productivity and team cultures that are things that you hear a lot. So let's hear, learn a little bit more from uh, from our experts here today, starting uh, with Nadia, I would say, as someone who has been responsible for people functions uh, of different remote teams. What would you say are the fundamentals of a remote team culture in, in your experience? Yeah, great question. I'm so fortunate to have been part of the remote working and Michael, that comment about async work really resonates with me. So asynchronous work for 
probably the last 10 years, right? So pre-pandemic. Um, and so during that time, learned a lot about culture, social connection, um, and building companies from 70 people to about a thousand people in under two years, right? So lots of scaling, uh, lots of touch points on the, the human factor of remote work. I think culture is such a weird element. If you look back in, I would say, uh, my, t my first 10 years in my career, it would have been very different from how I imagine culture now, right? Back then, I felt like cultures were really exclusive. It was potentially not built for globally diverse environments and distributed teams. And so the world has come to realize that it only served for people that either lived 30 kilometers away from the office or had a specific personality type and all the things that would have created the wrong kind of environments for people to feel that they can belong and psychologically safe in, et cetera. And so the world of remote work, I think, comes with this um, responsibility of being very intentional about the culture you create. And if you don't have that intentionality, I think it's just going to happen organically, whether you want to control it or not, right? And so to me, I think there's a bunch of foundations and the list can probably be a list of 10, but if I can focus on five or six today, I think to me, if the company has some sort of company values or operating principles or whatever you like calling it in your environment, that should probably be top of funnel when it, when it comes to culture, right? It cannot be something that you just write down in some um, open source handbook or on some amazing employer branding page. It's got to be elements that you've operationalized throughout every single process, how you engage each other, how you communicate, how you um, behave as a leadership team, right? Those values have to be completely operationalized and touched day to day. Also, how you reward folks, right? And, and the type of feedback that you're giving. I love dragging and, and building values into um, quarterly performance reviews, uh, feedback conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations. I love imprinting it even into surveys, right? No matter what survey you're running, from a candidate experience right through to an internal employ employee engagement survey, asking questions about those values are certainly going to help. But there are other elements. Back at my days at GitLab, I certainly believed initially that culture was values. There was no doubt in my mind. But now a few years later and working for a multitude of amazing tech startups and having had the privilege to scale a bunch of these companies, I feel like it's, there's way more to that, right? I think leadership behavior is still top for me. How your leadership team shows up, how they um, align to those values, how they communicate, how they think about inclusive language, how they work or don't work on weekends, right, or long hours. All of that starts setting your company up into a specific culture. Um, but there are other things as well. I love, you know, thinking about skills, competencies. Every company at every, I would say, stage has a specific competencies and set of skills that you might need. Um, and then lastly, I think your operating model. So whether you're remote or not, whether you're hybrid or not, the kind of flexibility that you stifle or that you create is gonna is literally going to drive the culture. And so, I mean, I can speak about this every single day um, for the rest <laughs> of my career probably, but I think there's a bunch of these core things that need to come together. And these to me are probably the most important. I'd love to bring up how you pay people, but I think then we, we're gonna go down a rabbit hole that we're not speaking about today. So I'll focus on those. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia, and a very insightful. Maybe Tobias, can you highlight a little bit what you believe are some other fundamentals to remote teams specifically for engineering teams? Yes, sure. Um, it, it's based a lot on what Nadia already shared. For me, one important thing is really making explicit what kind of communication do we have? Uh, do we have asynchronous communication and for what? And what's uh, synchronous communication? Because what I see when companies go remote, often they just uh, do this, they combine remote and asynchronously and they don't separate this. But these can be two things. Uh, and my take on this is, Many things like status updates uh, for your interest or like knowledge base uh, things can be asynchronously, but uh, engineering 
itself is a creative activity. This means we often need deep work time where we are uninterrupted. So um, that's good. Uh, asynchronous communication can help us there. But also sometimes it's very struggling and very difficult because we have new problems that we are facing and we can make better decisions as a team. So if we have collaborative, like I'm a big fan of uh, remote mock programming or team programming sessions because often the quality is much higher. And for me, that's synchronous, right? But it works very, very remotely if we have all the other things like only the, the update meetings and these kind of things are synchronous. We have a lot of time for deep teamwork. And this is great for the quality of the result, but it's also great for team building. So with my teams, I rarely do like team building exercises because we build great teams on the job by working together towards the same goal. So um, that would be my take on this. Thanks, very inspiring to hear indeed that you can build that culture, not only to the things that people used to do, like team building activities, but actually when you, you we work together and you, uh, yeah, you support one another on the, on those projects. Thanks for sharing. It's very, uh, very interesting to learn. And I think over the past year, a lot of layoffs, difficult times have been uh, happening, unfortunately. Um, and I know that it really has a huge impact on the trust that people put on leadership in, uh, in certain companies. What do you guys think are the biggest challenges when, uh, in, in terms of remote team cultures in, in, in your expertise at this point with, the, with all of the issues that we've seen in the, the past couple of months? I'm happy to start and Michael or uh, Toby, please jump in. I think to me, <laughs> You know, before the pandemic, many people would say it was a candidate market. So before all these layoffs, before we saw the change in economy and some of the stock market changes, I think everyone believed it was a, a people market, a candidate market, and that that's changed. But I don't believe it has changed. I, for one, will not work at a company that does not prioritize mental health and diversity right? I just won't want to align with organizations that don't deeply care about an inclusive, global, diverse, um, you know, amount of people that work there. And, and, and I, I hate calling it workforce, which is why I steered away from that word. But <laughs> I feel like that, that to me is, is part of the future of work. And having all these, you know, amazing time zones to lean in does create accessibilities in locations like Africa, right? So across continents that didn't necessarily have the opportunities to have access to Silicon Valley startups or European based amazing tech startups. And so I will say, I think, I think it's still a candidate market. And I think people simply don't tolerate um, cultures that are toxic, cultures that are about burnout, cultures that only lean into long, inflexible you know, working in working environments. And so to me, I think it's still very much a candidate market. Um, often when I look at candidates declining an offer, regardless of the company I work for, I often say to myself, are they declining the manager? Are they declining my TA partner or me? Like, why are they declining us? Is it purely money? I'm not convinced. Um, and as you, as you notice, some of these big audit firms, let's use um, KPMG, for example, I'm convinced bigger audit firms like the big five, so KPMG, but also Deloitte, et cetera, um, now have to become more flexible for the generation that simply doesn't tolerate sitting in an office nine to five and doesn't find that productive or meaningful, right? And does want the opportunity to deliver exceptional work, but not necessarily even from home, from wherever the hell they want to be, right? So I do <laughs> think it is it is really about People have changed the workplace and whether the pandemic um, sped that up or not, this is, we can't go back to, to how it used to be. No one wants to tolerate that level of inflexibility and, and sort of stifling the opportunity to have a great life outside of work. So I think that's the biggest change. And I do see a lot of organizations still hyperfixate on, um, on potentially returning to the office. But I also see a lot of enterprise corporate companies that are super flexible, including South African banks, which I've never expected, not, not in 2024. And it's wonderful to see. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Well, maybe, Michael, do you have uh, a view on, on what Nadia just shared? 
Yeah, yeah. So from from a personal perspective, like I'm seeing the same thing where there is a lot of media coverage of return to the office, return to the office, right? But yeah. under the surface, if you actually dive deep, it hasn't really changed that much from a remote setting. There's a lot of startups, there's a lot of companies that are coming about that are, are focused on remote first because, as Nadia said, like the younger generation are going – well, why would I be in an office? We've seen that it works remote. So why wouldn't we start our own company with that mindset, right? And then driving that forwards. Um, so I think it's about, it's, it's, it's digging into that, right? And really seeing that it isn't all RTO everywhere. There are remote roles out there and you are seeing like a huge community. I mean, when you look on LinkedIn at the remote working community, it's massive, right? And the more you get involved with those people, the more opportunities that you see um, I think the, I know we're going to talk about the future later, but the future is incredible for remote working and it is just going to continue to drive. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rod. So do you think that there are any opportunities that challenges that tech leaders should, uh, should consider in this case? Yeah. So one thing that I've been thinking about is the isolation. Um, and when I first started um, at the company I'm working at now called Spendesk, um, it was the first full remote role, right? The contract said remote, everything was remote. It was fantastic, but I lent into it too hard that it meant that I felt quite isolated. So having that touch point with members of your team, members in other teams, um, being able to have a space where you could meet up occasionally is always really helpful. Um, having team building on a regular cadence where you actually show up in person, uh, it takes a lot of involvement and a lot of organization, but the value is incredible. We recently did an offsite with my team where um, we focus mainly on the social aspect. And since then, the positive drive from the team was massive and that will last for a long time because we have those memories that we created. So it's not about getting together just to workshop, just to do more work. It's about getting together and being together and really like making the most of it spending that quality time. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. So let's dive into uh, the second topic of today. So it is uh, very naturally flowing into uh, to this. What are tech leaders doing to drive team culture in their distributed teams? So Tobias, you've been helping a bunch of companies setting up their solid remote uh, setups. What are the core things about team culture that shift when moving to a remote setup, uh, would you say? Yeah, very connected to the first topic, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, as the, I mean, uh, collaboration and communication for me is uh, the, the key point uh, in everything, because once we are communicating, we can solve out the rest, kind of, um, and we can continuously improve uh, the culture as, as we need it. But uh, communication is a lot more difficult in remote uh, setups, because like new remote companies sometimes don't have the right tools for that. They don't have the right like processes like when do I communicate something where um, do I like ping everybody just if I have an update or is it okay to just write it somewhere silent and people can follow up on that later and um, also the having time for social gathering uh, things that happen uh, at the coffee machine in the office that don't happen accidentally anymore that need to be more intentional so for example having space to have one-on-ones, not only between managers and um, the employees, but having a one-on-ones also with peers and just talking about like casual uh, stuff like uh, um, free time, hobbies, uh, health, family, whatever is uh, interesting um, or having collaboration sessions where when we have like a wait time because we wait for a build in an engineering team or something, don't spend that checking Slack, but spend that together and uh, spend that uh, talking about how you currently feel, what's going on, and so on. For leaders, the other thing is um, that we finally have to let go of this illusion of control that many might still have in the office. I see them working, so they are properly working. Um, that wasn't true in the office, but now you don't see them anymore, and you need to trust. And trust is one big thing. And the other thing that goes hand in hand is um, transparency. So we need to learn to communicate much better, much more asynchronously. So for example, with teams that start working remotely, we usually give updates uh, in a written form or maybe as a recorded video once a week so that other teams see what's going on, what are the new things that they can take so that we still connect with each other. And uh, the last thing I would like to mention is that um, 
autonomy is much more important now because people will have different working hours. People will maybe work in different time zones or like have different schedules in general. And therefore they need to be able to make good decisions on their own. And therefore we need to pay much more attention on have, do we have a clear strategy? Is the vision well communicated? Where do we want to go as a company or as a team? And how do we want to achieve this, right? What's what are our values and uh, what are we doing and what are we not doing and why? So the why becomes much more important because so that we create the alignment that allows the autonomy to happen afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, I think the why and deep, but also maybe a safe space and trust from new leadership because you don't see the people actually and you really need to trust and, and yeah, create that safe space. At least that's what I see a lot here at the at deal where I work, uh, of course. Uh, thanks, Tobias. So, uh, Michael, one of the things that become harder in remote teams is notice when things are not right. What we just discussed, like having that trust and that safe space. What is something that you guys are doing at uh, Spendes to keep that to to make sure that you understand what's happening and that you um, yeah you see it before it escalates? So, um, echoing what Toby was saying, it's the one to ones. Right. They are the most important, um, especially as a tech leader, they're the most important way of interacting with people. So one to ones traditionally years ago used to be very um, project update driven. Uh, I personally hate that. Like for me, one to ones are a chance for you to talk to them and them to talk to you about whatever it is that is important to them. Right. The whole idea is that they drive the one to one. So. The, the rules that I follow are you, you never cancel them. You always keep them unless there's something critical from either side, but both of you have to agree to move it. And the whole thing should be driven by them with you input in, like if, if things are a little bit quiet, right? Because sometimes it's you've got to drive these things out of people. Um, but that gives you the ability to understand the individual, uh, what their needs are, but also their personality, some of their quirks. So then you can, in the office, it was easier to be able to read people than it is remote. But if you do one-to-ones effectively, you can have exactly the same tools, right? You're in a meeting and you're sat there and you're like, mm, something's not right here, right? And you can yeah. then talk to them about it into one-to-one or in Slack or, but you have to build that relationship. You have to build that trust first. So whenever you start in a new team, it's always, that's the most important part, right? Is one-to-ones build the trust because once you get that, most of the time you don't have to notice anything's wrong. They will tell you, right? Because they yeah. believe in your leadership. They believe in your trust. Um, and the other part is when you look at it from a business perspective, it again goes back to what Toby said, which is you have to have an aligned vision, right? You have to have a real clear understanding of the why. You can't have yeah. people say, we need to do this thing, but don't ask why, right? Just get on with it, right? That doesn't work in a remote world because so you take them along really on a journey with you you would say exactly yeah because you have to give people the autonomy when they're working remotely right you have to give them the flexibility to know what they're delivering right so i know that probably a few people on this call have always had those jira task tickets that have been just a couple of lines which are like build x right now the entire world has moved to a use the story based you have to give the detail Otherwise, people don't know what they're building or or why. Like, what? Why is it important? Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Michael and Nadia. If things are not right, and and people who are so maybe uh, listening into this webinar would ask help of of people teams. What would you suggest, like tips, or how can we uh, get people teams involved to uh, to support? Yeah, great question. I will say a people team probably can't solve for a bad manager, right? So just setting expectations, the responsibility of managing a global team, no matter what you do at the company, whether you're a dev or engineering manager, or whether you are just a, a manager of marketing or, or um, account developers or whatever that looks like, right? A people team can't fix a manager's responsibilities of what they need to do in that team. And I love what Michael said around one-on-ones. I have very similar, um, I have a very similar approach to one-on-ones and I tend to hyper fixate on connection and checking in with each other versus updates. Like I never use a one-on-one for a stand-up or just to 
go through a bunch of updates that we can discuss asynchronously. I think the people function has changed. I don't, I, I think the biggest difference for me is we're part of the company, right? We are actually one team having very similar goals, having very similar missions. And it's about enabling a manager to do great things. And that means making space for very good documentation, right? Having, um, having a really good template and learning material to help that manager that's maybe a first time manager, especially in tech startups, like I can vouch for that. We at Comunda are very, very fortunate to have amazing and very experienced managers. But I have seen, you know, early stage managers entering the world of tech very quickly in their careers. And so providing that guidance, providing that space to collaborate, to have a retrospective on things that, you know, hasn't worked. So even learning from engineering very often, I've brought a lot of that and product, right, into the world of people. If you're building products for people, it's about enablement. You've got to create the space in your people function for folks to have time and space to connect, right? And to have the right tools, the right uh, space for documentation, the right um, timing of those things. Uh, a silly example is, I remember a few years back, I was looking at an annual calendar, right? And I, I looked at an engagement survey that was going out. And at the same time, there was a performance review. And I said to the leadership team, like, you can't do that to our engineering managers. <laughs> How the heck are they supposed to like, you know, enable and encourage the whole team to complete an engagement survey of 55 questions and combined with that, run a performance review of each, let's say each engineering manager having 10 to 15 people reporting into them, including self reviews, right? So I think it, a people team needs to start really looking at the picture holistically. Sometimes it's about dialing out and looking very high level in, and sometimes it's just about pro providing the space to ask any question, to create transparency, to um, inviting other opinions in. Some of my absolute best work was actually done in collaboration with other people that already worked at the company. It was never like I came up with this like amazing idea that I should have won some sort of prize with. It was usually because I invited engineering managers or product folks or ICs into the conversation to tell me why something isn't working for them. And then based on that feedback, making those iterations on our processes. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think you see a lot of pots as well in, in a deal as well, where people really work together and you see great team collaboration. And, and I think people actually wanted to help one another because they understand why they're doing it. And I think that comes back to what we all have said several times. I think that the remote culture is really important to share what you're doing, why you're doing it, get that engagement. And I think what I would love to learn maybe from you, Tobias, is Michael shared a bit around the things that are non-negotiable, even if people are tired of Zoom or online meetings. What would you say is something that is really important to always stick to with regards to having having that quality time with your team members when, when things are uh, a bit, I don't know, uh, stressy or like people are a bit tired of Zoom? What would you advise the audience um, to 100% stick to? Mm, uh, so definitely also the like the one-on-ones or the the team weeklies. Uh, if you if you have something like like the social connection part, that's that's the important thing. And I would scratch almost everything else. Like um, for example, do you really need dailies? Like as an update, I did this yesterday. I will do this today, and so on. I don't think so. We we ran without two years, without dailies, and it was perfect because we collaborated a lot. We had a lot of uh, talking throughout the, the week. Other teams, they use the dailies more for social connection, which is nice because you start the day together if your timing allows that. Um, so yeah, make sure that you that you remove everything else. And then I don't think people have Zoom fatigue of these uh, social interactions because they they are warm, they are nice, they, they are good. Um, they allow us to build a relationship to feel like you belong together as a team, that we are actually working as a team. Um, people have Zoom fatigue from sitting in endless meetings where they need to listen for one or two hours without being able to contribute and these kind of things. And for that, I would say free record them or uh, write, a, write a text, share that asynchronously. And then maybe if you want to have feedback, 
you can still schedule an office hour where people can come and uh, and ask you in person questions if if they want to. But for most people, it might be fine just to to watch your recording at uh, two times the speed and get done with it, right? Um, yeah, I think that's um that 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 part is super key, right? Is should we really be doing this asynchronous? Like that would save so many people's Zoom fatigue, right? Which is real. Um, we've recently had a few sessions where we've had to focus and and build together, right? Whole team like mob programming on stuff, and those sessions are fantastic because it's not all building. You also have the social interaction where somebody will say something completely random, right? But you don't <laughs> feel fatigued. But if you have days and days of meetings and workshops and stuff that becomes tiring. So for us as leaders, it's like thinking from an asynchronous first of, is there a way to do this that gives somebody the focus flexibility to do this on their own time? Or do I have to synchronize this? And that's the best way to really move away from the Zoom fatigue is using Zoom when makes sense and the energy levels are going to be high versus those where people are just sat there watching you run through slides. I'm quite harsh, so I love this, and I'm so on board with you, but I cancel all meetings that doesn't have an agenda 24 hours ahead, and I learned this. It took time, right? But I just, I'm just like, hey, folks, there's no agenda items, cancelling. And I, I do set, I obviously set that expectation as well, um, but there's no need to go into a meeting if there's no discussion, right? Our current chief people officer is really good at even doing that with her leadership team, so that it is it rolls up and it rolls down right um so we all experience that in the same way if i had a discussion item and i never added it and i'm waiting till five minutes before a call to go and add this super important topic i don't think it was that important if i did, if i only spend five minutes on on the prep right and so i do think it's about setting good boundaries with each other and cancelling meetings, meetings with no no agendas something i do notice a lot as an observer if you look at companies that, that are doing meetings for the sake of meetings, right? And let's, I'm not even gonna pick on an industry. Let's just use the world in general. I have observed people sitting in those meetings with their screens off and watching Netflix, like, and, and not in my current companies because we don't have space for that, right? And, and we do cancel meetings and we don't have two hour sessions. People are engaged, their screens are on. We are all showing up in the same way and in the same, taking the same ownership to be there what i am seeing is in other companies which just to stand up every single day about the same topics that they spoke about the day before is everyone's checked out so i'm not 100 percent sure that's productive either yeah so that yeah. needs to be a good, good expectation i would say that that's what i hear you saying we have that as well in our company where the ceo literally wrote guys cancel the meeting if there's no agenda that being said keep the one-on-ones in because we had some leaders that were also canceling then one-on-one so that was a little bit uh, tricky where that meeting is that quality time without any uh, agenda sorry michael you were gonna say something and yeah, I, it's uh, just jumped uh, into the, it. <laughs> the agenda thing is just uh, it is everything right because it yeah. shows that you care right you, if you put effort into it to write an agenda somebody's gonna look at that and go oh this means something, right? I, I know what the purpose is. I know what the outcomes are. Oh, great. There's even a Miro board, right? Or something similar so that I can yeah. prep for it. Um, and then when you look at it, you just think, okay, I've written an agenda. This might actually be asynchronous as well, right? If I've moved this far, do I even need a meeting for this? Or can I do all the prep work and go, here's everything that you need? So it gives you that stopping time rather than reacting and going, I need to book in a meeting with like zero information. So those meetings where there is no agenda, they're too reactionary. And by the time you get there, like the person has probably prepped it five minutes before and it's never productive. And um, as Nadia was saying, so many people have checked out because they only like then come in at the end and go, so why are we here? Right. And you've wasted an hour of people's time. And in our industry, that's valuable time that you should be spending on building things for customers. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing it. I 100% I agree. I think same for sales teams that I run. I think it's very important to have expectations, show you care, do that prep work and make sure people are engaged. 
hundred percent true as well. Like have people have the videos on, so there is that connection. So you can read the room and really have um, people present. And I think also what we see is have uh, Slack on mute because otherwise people are multitasking. Even though thing, we believe we can do it, it's uh, not efficient for uh, for the meeting. So the last topic of today, uh, before we go into the the questions of um, the listeners. Looking at the futures, what is Dev Team Culture developing into? So what are trends that you anticipate with regards to remote team culture in, in engineering uh, teams? All of you, uh, who feel free to, to answer. Uh, I can start. So for me, like a remote first will become the norm, more or less, because um, even now that we see companies going back to office, in reality, they are still hybrid somehow. And if you are hybrid but don't prepare for remote first, you get the worst from both sides. You get like the worst from the office and the worst from remote, and uh, it can help you to focus on remote first. So make sure that you have a documented source of truth that uh, you know where you write things, that you make a habit of documenting, of um, sharing uh, updates asynchronously. So that benefits the people in the office, but it also benefits the people who are not in the office. And I think in general, also, we see a tendency because I'm, I agree with Nadia that we still have a candidate market. So, um, and candidates will want to work more remotely um, because they had a taste of it during the pandemic um, that that works well if, in terms of productivity. So, and maybe they saw the benefits for their work-life balance, even though in the pandemic it was very restricted because yeah, we could not travel so much and so on. But um, they saw some benefits of that and more people will demand that. So it's better to prepare for that and to put effort into removing the friction from your remote work. And that will benefit uh, you even if you say we are not a remote first company. I think that's very, uh, very important. Yeah. So. And, and to me, something obvious and Michael, Toby, um, Eileen, it's probably obvious to you as well. I'm not convinced it's obvious to everyone. But if you think about engineers and the performance review culture, I still see companies comparing, you know, one person to the other. I still see that like nearly personality matching or can we just clone this amazing engineer and, and having more of that. And I think engineers will demand for that to stop. The amount of individual folks that we see, right? Folks with uh, true identities, folks that know who they are. And the, I nearly want to say that the diversity in an engineering team now compared to 10 years ago has literally changed entirely. Even just the global di dynamic makes it so fascinating and awesome and interesting, right? But there's many reasons why you need to start comparing folks to where were they six months ago to how are they performing now six months later? And it's such a, such a, a small thing, but that does impact culture. When you keep comparing people to other people, you are building a culture that they need to live up to a standard that doesn't actually exist in their world, right? And so I do think that more inclusion will be demanded by engineers. I see that every single day in hiring, right? I, I literally see folks asking, what is your policy on DEI? What are you doing to create an inclusive environment where everyone feels that they can belong in your engineering team? And so those are the things that I, I think if companies are behind on, I would get ahead on now. So from from my side, the, the the bit I'm a little bit worried around is data, right? And the way that we measure people's productivity, performance, all of that type of stuff, that we go too far, right? We go to a point where it really dictates somebody to a point that's not real, right? It's that You've got to put the people first and the data second, right? The data is there to call out specific points. But as we move to a more remote hybrid world, the danger is that we rely so much on the data, we forget about the people, right? And we we end up making poor decisions um, because we're not really connecting in the right way. Um, saying that, the, the best way to avoid that is why what we're doing now, right? Is still focusing on the people. As Nadia said, like with the diversity and stuff, you you really focus on what can this person do? what What is their future like? What can they bring to the company? It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter where they're working. You give them the opportunity to work in the best way for them, right? So one-to-ones, they drive that, giving them flexibility, asynchronous working, like all of these tools that we have today, you can use them 
whether you're in an office, whether you're hybrid, whether you're remote, it doesn't matter. They're all best practices. What we've really seen and what we'll see more of is remote work has shifted the way we work. And it doesn't matter where you work, it has completely fundamentally changed the way we work. You've moved away from a time where you would join a company. Well, there's still companies out there that probably do this, but where you join a company and there's no documentation, right? You have to ask the expert for information on this specific thing. More and more companies now are adopting that documentation first policy through the remote working because it was a necessity, but it helps people in the office as well because it means that X person can go off sick and the entire company won't come crumbling down, right? So um, the future is about making sure that we have all of these learnings, all of this stuff, and applying it to the way that we work no matter where we are. Thanks, uh, thanks for sharing that. So maybe two other tips from uh, from you guys that um, you can recommend to the people listening in, like how can people really prepare for the future of, uh, of remote work? I heard a lot of uh, interesting things already, but if you could give like two real big important things to do. Um, sorry, for me, um... I think it, it's getting involved in the community, right? The number one, that's the biggest thing because the more you learn about this, the more you can apply to your teams or people around you, right? And it doesn't matter what position you are. You don't have to be a leader to impact change, right? You just have to work with the people around you and go, hey, I heard about this thing. What do you think? Can we try it out? Um, in agile working, I think the only real important meeting that we have is retrospectives, right? The rest are fine, whatever. Like sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. But retros are really key because you get that consistent feedback from people. So get engaged with the community, learn something, share it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, that's fine, right? There will always be something else to do. And then the, on the other side, the, the other area to really focus on is understanding um, your own management of your own time, right? Really using the flexibility of remote working and helping other people use that. We're in a world now where we should be focusing on ourselves first and work second. Now, I know a lot of companies probably don't want that, um, but like it's the reality of it, right? We've got to put ourselves first. We've got to make sure that we work at the time that works best for us because we'll be more productive for the company. We've got to look after our mental health because it will also help our productivity. There's all these things that remote working enables for us to do. So look in on yourself, like when do you work best? What times are best for you? Um, you've also got to look at yourself and go, uh, so uh, Stevie, I saw your um, note where it was like, in the office, you walk around a little bit more, but why? What's different between remote working and being in the office that allows you to do that? And is there a way to make that happen when you're remote working? Um, like commute is one of those things that I've talked about before where now that we're remote working, the commute is gone. And with that, you actually lose some of the benefits of knowing when your day starts and knowing when your day ends. So what can you do to change that? Bring in a fake commute. Right, do something different. Do something that you think is useful. Right, I, I really love that. I think so many people are are struggled with that. Like, how do you stop? And indeed, um, I, I think a lot of people work from home in their bathrooms or whatever. And so, this tip I think is super, super helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I end my day reading a book, and I've never read so much in my life before. Like <laughs> remote working, I hated reading. It was like, yeah. oh, why would I do that? I can watch TV. Waste of whereas, time. <laughs> yeah, whereas now I end the day reading and it's become natural. It's like the it's yeah. the stopping point, right? So it's about finding what that is and being able to go, this is how I start my day, this is how I end my day, and really separating work and, and personal life so that you're not feeling like you're constantly in that work mindset. Thanks, Sarah. Sorry, I thought Nadia yeah. wanted to say something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'll just add like a quick tip. Um, you have to invest in social invest, like in, in social time. You cannot, 
expect managers in your organization to um, do all these amazing initiatives for free. So if you can look at your budgets, focus on investing in social connection. That does that might mean, depending on where you're located and how, that you need some together time, right? I love that Kamunda is prioritizing that. I mean, I've never worked at a remote first company that's prioritizing it this much. It does include long haul flights. So it obviously does mean some folks are going to travel longer than others. But if social connection is important to those folks, they're going to be on those flights and they're going to show up for that FaceTime, right? Also in your weeks, um, if you are not investing time that is purely spent on social connection within your teams, it's going to be really difficult to create a, a, an amazing culture and to get to know each other. I've worked in teams that I've, I think I've had a closer connection with than sitting in an office with, right? And a healthier connection with, just because we really invested in social connection. Um, and so that may, that means investing money and time into, into those type of initiatives. I really love hearing that. I think a deal, what we have as well is we really have a budget allocated to anyone in the company to travel or have dinner with their colleagues. And I think it's so important, like you said, to have that moment to really connect with one another. And I think, um, that really makes a difference in then working working together and set yourself up for success. Whereas again, coming back to that trust and that safe environment that is not built just talking business. That really that that connection as well. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Nadia. Um, I want to make sure that we also have some time to answer the questions from the people listening in. So I have one question from the audience. Uh, feel free to uh, to answer uh, or answer them. What are some of the tools or techniques that you have been particularly helpful in fostering remote team cultures? I think trust is number one. If you've hired someone and you still don't trust them on the day that they start, your hiring process sucks. So I still think <laughs> it's about 100% trust from day one. There's no such thing as building trust after you've hired someone, not in a distributed remote company. You've got to make sure that you are inviting someone in, right? And I have worked for companies where it wasn't the case and you pick on it, you pick it up really quickly. And that creates a different kind of culture where if there is no trust, how are you supposed to engage in an asynchronous way or working non-linear hours, right? So I, I still think trust is number one. If you're not trusting the employees you've hired, you've made a mistake in your hiring. So it really starts actually at the beginning where you do the interviews, you take the time for it, get to know someone and spend a little bit more time than uh, maybe you did before uh, having a remote team. When, yeah. uh, when you said tools, my brain just went to like actual tools, right? Um, <laughs> so I was thinking like, sure. <laughs> like whiteboarding, right? I, the whiteboarding tools that are available now because of what happened in the pandemic are insane, right? That some of them are incredible. And that really helps with asynchronous working and collaboration because so many people are visual, right? And it really helps to explain something and go, this is what I'm talking about, rather than trying to explain it in words or via Slack or over text. So a lot of updates I do is via video because when I'm typing, eventually I get to a point where I don't want to type anymore, like my brain hurts. So I just like, record a quick video and then using a whiteboarding tool I can run through a flow or run through designs or whatever and what I find is that teams respond really well to that right individuals respond really well because it's more personal um for them like usually towards the end of the day they don't want to read anymore and having that tool right a whiteboarding thing just means that you you've then got something historical as well which means that somebody can reference back um so yeah for me it's really invest in a really good whiteboarding tool that the entire company uses. I would like to add to that. And uh, I also thought about tools in the technical sense, um, <laughs> like the whiteboard tools also make meetings much more interactive, right? When you, when you look together on a whiteboard, it's like you are in, in a real office. Actually, we had a fun story um, with one team I was working together. We came together in an office as a tech leadership community and wanted to work on a whiteboard together. And, we went back to Miro because the physical whiteboard was 
not working well for us, then who has the, bad, uh, the best handwriting and these kind of things. So um, I, I second that. And also other tools are important, like a good video conferencing tool. Many tools out there are actually not that great. So for example, I, I enjoy Zoom a lot because we can have breakout rooms. We can have um, like the video quality is very good. The noise cancellation is very good. So we, we can interact much better. And then of course, the last thing is have a, a tool, whatever that is, that is your single source of truth where people document things and where you know this is the, the route where I can go to. And from there, I find everything else because otherwise things get lost. I don't know, is it is it maybe Notion? Is this in Miro? Is this in Slack? Is this in, in another third tool? And uh, if I know, okay, our handbook is a Notion, for example, or something else, it doesn't really matter. Then I can go there and I find the pointers to whatever resource I'm looking for. And uh, that makes it much easier. And it's important to agree on that, uh, actually on a company level, what this this entry point should be. Thanks, very, very useful indeed. Um, I have some other another question um, from Mariana. How do you deal with people that do not want to turn on the camera? I think it's about setting those expectations up front. And so as you sent the invite to this meeting, right, if you need to change that in your team, it's about over communicating that this is happening, doing it nice and far in the future so folks can plan, double clicking on is that time still the right time to host the meeting for everyone. It's no fun to have a school commute and trying to join a team meeting, right? So I think it's about just figuring out what are the boundaries here? Why did we, why are we having that meeting at that time? And, and then just saying like, we, we have shared ownership. We need everyone to engage in the call. And if you're not engaging, why are you in the call? Right. I remember Yo, my previous CEO at remote saying to, saying to me, listen, if folks aren't engaging in a conversation in a meeting, why are they there? Because if they're purely listening, can they read it asynchronously? Can they watch it later? Like, can they do something else? And so to me, it's about, we all have equal ownership and an equitable experience. And that also means we all should show up in the same way. I personally don't like talking to a bunch of offline cameras because I have no idea like what folks are doing and What's I happening? don't feel safe, right? If we're only two people, imagine the four of us today and one of us had our cam camera on. Be super awkward. I think I would just like end up switching off my camera. So I always say if it's cameras on, everyone's cameras are on. If it's cameras off and all of us are off camera, why are we meeting? Can we yeah, do why? we need to do this in a different way? Right. And so I think it's just about setting those expectations. But you might need to go through a bit of a change strategy. I hate using enterprise lingo, but you probably need to go through a bit of a change strategy before you just make that change and over communicate why you're doing it. But I genuinely prefer video on if I'm in a meeting and we all need to engage. Also, if it's a very large meeting, why are you having a very large meeting, right? If it's company wide, like an all hands, why are you doing that? There must be a mission for that meeting. And if it's working for you and that's what you always done, just make sure people are actually engaging in the conversation and showing up for that meeting. Thanks. And I think it all comes back again to explaining why it's important, the reason behind it, getting people along, maybe also a little bit of vulnerability where you as a leader explain why it's so important and that you feel unsafe when you present something and you share your vision. You want to make sure to, to get people along with you. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nadia. Uh, last question. Um, oh, sorry, Thomas, you wanted to say something? I, I just wanted to add to that, that also uh, a huge part of our communication happens not uh, like via what we are saying, but actually how we behave, how our mimic gestures and so on. Even when we are not talking, I can see uh, Nadia is uh, nodding, so she probably agrees to that. But if she would have a uh, uh, camera off, I would not know. Is is she understanding what I'm telling? Is she against that? Is she for that? Do I need to clarify my point a bit more? All of that is so important. And I, I read somewhere that it's around 60% of communication that happens uh, in the visual channel. And also I wouldn't go in, in an office with a like mask on and like sunglasses <laughs> so that you cannot see my faces. So why should I do this on a camera? I love that how you explain it. Indeed, that's 100% true. Uh, thanks, uh, Tobias. 
Then, sorry, because we have one more minute left, uh, I want to uh, wrap up. Thanks all for, for joining this webinar. I hope they, it was interesting for you. If you have any questions, reach out to us so we can come back uh, with answers. Thanks all for uh, being on stage with me. I hope you enjoyed sharing your experience as much as I love learning from you guys. So um, there are some more events um, that are will be hosted um, that are now showing up on screen where you can vote which one you would love to, uh, to join. Um, thanks again, and uh, I hope you have a, a lovely day.